and thank you for that very warm welcome. It's great to be back in Wales. Uh, got very happy memories of coming here earlier this year. Uh, we just, a few days earlier, launched this brand new political movement. It was much needed. There was certainly a gap in the market. Um, and we launched our campaign uh, down here in Wales. And of course, on the European election date, we topped the poll by a country mile in Wales, coming first in most of these seats here in South Wales. It was a remarkable... <laughs> it was a pretty remarkable achievement in the space of just six weeks. Now, since then, since then, we've had some big political changes. I think our result help get rid of not just the worst Prime Minister in living memory, but probably the worst Prime Minister in the history of our nation. Yeah. And into that space, of course, bounded, full of optimism, full of energy, Boris Johnson. And I'd be the first to say he did inherit a very difficult position. Uh, but he's now fighting this election, telling us that he'll get Brexit done. Well, I'll talk a bit more about that in a few moments. But I'm very struck at something the commentators don't seem to understand. They didn't understand it back in 2015 when I led UKIP, and they still don't get the point. There seems to be this very lazy assumption in our national media that Brexiteers are all actually Conservatives that Brexiteers are all on the centre-right of politics. And it is a fundamental misunderstanding. There were five million people that voted Brexit and then voted Labour in the 2017 general election. Five million of them. And, of course, here in South Wales, so many constituencies that voted Leave and that now have a Remainer MP an MP that wants to put a second referendum to the people uh, with not really much of a choice. I think, in some ways, perhaps Diane Abbott summed up the Labour position best. Uh, no, really, honestly. <laughs> there were no numbers involved, don't worry. But there she was on Question Time the other week, and Labour are going to win the election, negotiate a new deal, put that deal against Remain to the British public in a referendum, and then campaign against the deal that they've negotiated. I mean, you couldn't actually make this stuff up. Now, it's pretty clear that the Labour Party have decided, or should I say the London Labour Party have decided. I mean, it's more about Islington than his loin, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, that is where the Labour Party <laughs> is run from. But no, they, their policy, quite clear, you know, they want to make you vote again, because first time round, you didn't know what you were voting for, did you? You stupid little people. You know, you really must do better next time. I mean, it's it, not only patronising, not only insulting, but the choice that Mr Corbyn wants to give us is Remain versus a new form of Remain. Labour will crush the result of that referendum, and Labour have made it clear they actually don't believe that they as a party, we as a, a nation, are good enough to make our own laws. They want those laws made in Brussels, uh, and they've made that perfectly clear. So, and you've heard it already uh, on this platform this morning, but it's true. During the referendum, in the wake of the referendum, in the run-up to and including the manifesto for the Labour Party in 2017, there was an absolute promise that they would implement the result of the referendum and honour the will of the people, and there's no other word I can use than they have betrayed that trust. It's gone.
Now, of course, there's much talk about the Remain Alliance, which perhaps in Wales is more significant than it is in any other part of the United Kingdom, the Greens, Plaid, and the Liberal Democrats, uh, basically fighting together on a revoke ticket. I mean, amazing, isn't it? That you can just seek to abolish the result of the greatest democratic exercise in the history of these islands, and yet that's what they want to do. I suppose uh, at least we know what they stand for. Well, they do actually. They stand for revoking the result of the referendum. And so they put their alliance together. Uh, now, you may know that I've been calling for a leave alliance. Uh, I was very, very struck that we had, in the wake of the European elections, we had the Peterborough by-election. And we were the challengers to Labour in that seat. But there was a Conservative candidate. And, of course, the Remain Labour candidate won. And, indeed, shortly after that, in Brecon and Radnor. There was another by-election in which it turned out that the Conservatives were the challengers to the Liberal Democrats, but we also stood, got a significant number of votes, and guess what? The Remainer Lib Dem won. Two consecutive by-elections, won by Remainers, because there had been no sensible working accommodation between people who say that they're on the Leave side. So I've been calling for this Leave Alliance, calling for uh, Conservatives if they're on the right track. I'll come back to that. But calling for Conservatives if they're on the right track, the Brexit Party, and you know, some quite senior Labour figures who would want to be part of this, if that Leave Alliance was put to the country, it would win a very big majority. Uh, and it's not... Let me, let me just make this clear. You know, you can read in the newspapers that somehow I'm trying to split the vote. I'm not trying to split the vote. It's the Conservative Party who do not want to come to any accommodation, who want to put their own interest, the party interest, over what I think is the national interest. But I'm going to go on trying for a few more days and make the point that in Torfane and other constituencies here in South Wales, the Conservatives haven't won for 100 years. And they are not going to win here on December the 12th. There is no chance of them winning. So I would make this urgent plea to Boris Johnson and others, don't split the Brexit Party vote here in South Wales. We are the challengers to the Labour Party, and if you're not in the field, we will beat Labour in many of these constituencies. But it does need a bit of movement on policy from Boris Johnson. All right, he inherited a difficult position. The clock was running down to the 31st of October. He wanted to get rid of the backstop. He got rid of the backstop, and he's now presenting this as being the most extraordinary, great new deal. Well, on examination, and I know Mark has been through some of the detail, it is not a great New Deal, it's Theresa May's bad old treaty. And the claim, get Brexit done, well, it's tempting, isn't it? Because we're all pretty hacked off, aren't we, after three years that this has not been delivered. So it's a really good slogan until you examine the fact that actually, if he wins a majority on this ticket, ratifies the treaty, all we do is go straight into three more agonising years of negotiations. Uh, and our hands are already tied in those negotiations, made clear in the documents that to get a trade deal with the EU, we have to have regulatory alignment, even in areas like taxation. We have to accept the principles of the common fisheries policy continue, and I could go on with a long list. Our hands will be tied. It's very unlikely we'll be free to strike deals with the rest of the world. In fact, I was talking to an American friend of mine the other day about this, and uh, he told LBC Radio that he thought it was extremely unlikely there'd be a trade deal between the UK and the US if we continue down 
this route. So I, I would say this to Boris Johnson. If you really believe that for the course of the next five weeks you can get away with telling the British public that this gets Brexit done, I think you're in for a bit of a surprise. It's rather like, to me, it's rather like a second-hand car salesman. So we'll have a look at this. It's a nice little runner. And it's got a really shiny bonnet that's just been polished up the day before. And you think the price looks all right. And you say, can I have a look under the bonnet, please? No, there's no time for that, Governor. You know, you've got to buy it now or someone else will take it. And that's what Boris did. You know, late on that Thursday evening in Brussels, he agreed to these documents. He then had the first Saturday sitting of Parliament for 37 years because he wanted to rush it through before anybody had actually read it, anybody had actually absorbed it. I spoke to uh, fr MPs, friends of mine, who said, oh, isn't it marvellous? I said, well, have you read it? Well, we haven't had time yet to read it, but, <coughs> you know, we've been briefed that it's a very good deal. Well, I have to say, I'm beginning to wonder whether the Prime Minister has read it. No, I really mean that because he's given wholly inaccurate answers in the House of Commons on what it means for Northern Irish exporters selling goods into the rest of the United Kingdom. Amazing, isn't it? There he was at the DUP conference just a year ago declaring his love for the Union and saying that no British Prime Minister would put a border down the Irish Sea, and yet that's exactly what he's done. So he got that answer wrong. He was then asked a question about fishing. He gave an answer that was completely and utterly wrong, and I'm wondering whether he's actually read it. So I put this challenge out today. If you really believe that this is a great new deal, or as you said in the last couple of days, a fantastic deal, if you really are trying to tell the British public this gets Brexit done, let's have a civilised head to head debate on what this EU treaty means. <laughs> and I'd be only too happy to stand with Boris and to talk this through because I have read it and I haven't memorised it all but I've got a lot of it in my mind and frankly folks it's not Brexit. It's a short term political fix and an attempt to win a general election. And I am not, I am just not, after 25 years of campaigning, for us to be a free, independent nation, I'm not prepared to simply stand aside and see this sold down the river, and nor are many millions, many millions of people out there who will vote for us on December the 12th. Boris, your deal will not survive scrutiny. Your deal will not survive a head-to-head -head debate with me. Your deal will not last five weeks. So please, over this weekend, make some changes. Make it clear that we absolutely have to leave at some point in 2020 with or without any form of deal. And any form of deal must be a trade deal, yeah. not one based on regulatory and political alignment. Now, I hope he does it. <laughs> I, sincerely, I sincerely hope that he does it. I don't know whether he will. Either way, as Nathan has said, here in Wales, we are ready to fight all 40 seats. And if in the end, the choice is revoke with the Lib Dems implied, is a second referendum with Labour, is a Remainers Brexit with Boris, you can guarantee one thing, you'll be able to vote for a clean break Brexit because we will be on the ballot paper here in every seat in Wales. <laughs> there are so many other things we should be talking about. You know, we really should be talking about jobs and the economy. Amazing, isn't it? We've got the Chancellor 
splurging hundreds of billions here and not to be outdone, uh, Labour promising even more billions there. No one's talking in this campaign about wealth creation. No one's talking about the five and a half million brave souls in our country who are sole traders, self-employed, doing their best. They're the ones that create real wealth in an economy. They're the ones that create real jobs in the private sector. None of this is being debated in this campaign. And I also want to move the debate on to political reform, because it seems to me that what Brexit's exposed is that our system is no longer fit for purpose, and we need some massive changes. I think a, a very good start would be to abolish the organisation that now houses 600 friends of Tony Blair and David Cameron. And is uh, very clearly being used during the course of this election campaign to encourage certain people to say certain things. I won't go further than that or I'll get myself in trouble. So let's get rid of the House of Lords. Let's get a voting system that actually makes Parliament more reflective. Many, many things to talk about and campaign about in the years to come. But unless we get a proper Brexit, actually we're not going to be free to make most of those decisions. Uh, we... We in the Brexit Party put this thing back on track. You know, it all looked lost earlier on this year. We reset the agenda. We got rid of that Prime Minister. We now just need this Prime Minister to shift direction. If he does, fantastic. If he doesn't, well, we'll stand up and fight for Brexit on our own. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. We're just going to have a, a couple of questions that we've had from people who have come here and have had the opportunity to, um, to write them down on one of these cards. So without further ado, Rebecca from Pontypool, whoever, you, excellent. What is your policy on animal welfare? What will you do about non-stun slaughter and live export? I'm going to hand that one over actually to Anne. Yes, because this is... Um, just in case you're wondering why that one came to me, uh, I used to be the vice president of the RSPCA. Uh, and uh, I will say this. Britain has the best animal welfare, welfare laws in all of the EU. We do actually care about the welfare of animals. But I was asked specifically about live exports. We can deal with that after we leave the EU and are no longer bound uh, by their laws and their rules. And then we, we can determine uh, whether or not we export uh, anything live or not. Uh, and we can determine also the conditions under which it's done if it is. So leave the EU and our animal friends will be very grateful. Thank you. Okay, so this is one from Margaret from Abergavenny. We have an 8,000 majority in Monmouthshire for the Tories. I'm concerned that Corbyn will get in. How will you manage this, Nigel? Well, I'm not sure that Corbyn's going to win Monmouth. <laughs> um, but it's back to the same question, isn't it? I mean, you can't split the vote if we're standing for Brexit and they're standing for half in, half out. If they're different propositions, you can't split the vote. But, and I repeat the point... Firstly, uh, if they move to a sensible position, then there are the grounds, absolutely, to form some kind of one-off electoral alliance. And secondly, I would say this. There is so much, back to my first comments uh, this morning, there is so much rubbish written about this in the Johnson supporting press. I had it all back in 2015 when I led UKIP. I was told that as a result of what I was doing, there was no doubt that Miliband was going to form the next government propped up by the SNP. And, of course, when Election Day came, what was the net effect of the UKIP 4 million votes? It was we took more Labour votes than we took Conservative votes. In fact, Cameron wouldn't have got a majority. There wouldn't have been a referendum 
had it not been for the UKIP vote in those elections. And I do think, once again, that people writing things like that are not coming to constituencies like this, meeting Labour Leave voters who have got no other home to go to now than the Brexit party. So I think, actually, the whole thing is a pretty false premise. OK, we've got one from Andrea. It says, by not standing as a candidate, will Nigel not lose support? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a very, very good question, isn't it? I was told the other day, Nigel, you should have run as a candidate because Jeremy Corbyn is running in Islington. Well, it wouldn't really matter who Labour put up in Islington, would it? They're going to win that seat anyway. Uh, and, you know, the Labour Party's been around for 130 years. The Conservative Party have been around for a couple of hundred years. They've got their safe areas. They've got their data. We're a brand new organisation. They've been going for six months. So I could, as I tried in 2015, try to lead a party and be hunkered down in a constituency. That was an option, but this option is better because this option, and I've got 60 events booked, large, medium and small size events booked all around the country, and I intend to travel the length and breadth of the United Kingdom between now and December the 12th, firstly making people understand the extent to which Labour has betrayed them, and secondly, to make people understand that this new treaty that Boris is putting forward does not get Brexit done, and in doing so, I will be supporting our candidates from Land's End to John O'Groats. I think my time and my effectiveness is much greater being with you this morning and as I've been for the rest of this week, mostly in the, in the Midlands and the north of England, I think my time is better used. I think I'm more effective visiting scores of constituencies than spending half of my time in one. Thank you. And I'd very much like to thank Nigel on behalf of all of the, um, the candidates in Wales for him coming here. And I know that... He will I'll be come back. again. I'll yes, be back. Absolutely. Don't worry. Okay, final one. Nadia from Buff Wells. People would like to see a party manifesto. Is there one available and where? Well, the word manifesto. Now, let's, let's do a word association test. If I say manifesto, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Nice. Thank you. <laughs> All of which amuse me to hear Pretty Patel <laughs> setting out this morning the, the Conservative immigration. Uh, uh, ma uh, man manifesto, which, you know, the last three elections, they've talked about reducing the numbers to tens of thousands because that's what voters want to hear, but they never actually intended to do anything about it. So we will not have a document that is called a manifesto. It's a bad word. It's been tainted. We will call it our contract with the British people. Uh, it is in, it is, well... I looked at it last night. We're 95% ready. We will launch it in a couple of weeks. And yet, we will cover all areas of our national life, but making the point that this Brexit is the defining issue of our times. Far better to leave on the 31st of January with a clean break than to enter into years and years more of fruitless negotiations from which we will never, ever be free. Thank you very much, Nigel. Thank you for coming to Wales and taking the time out from her own campaign to come here to help us, from Mark and from Richard. And a big thank you to each of you for coming here, for being a part of history, because whether you realize it or not, we are living history right now. We are making it. We are going to change politics in Britain for good. And for heaven's sakes, it needs it, doesn't it? So thank you very much, and uh, we hope you enjoyed it.